All right, we're going to get the meeting started. It's 10 o'clock, and we always start promptly. For those of you that would like to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance, please rise. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, divisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome you all to the 2022 deliberative session for the Governor Wentworth Regional School District. My name is Randy Walker, and I have the pleasure and pri privilege of serving as your moderator today. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the people up at the head table, let me introduce them to you. And I'll start with Heather Cummings, who is actually not at the table. She's up in the back uh, booth, who'll be running the uh, PowerPoint presentation. She is our assistant superintendent. We then have on your far right, and if you just raise your hand as I call your names, um, Dana Streeter from Ossipee. We have Stephanie King from New Durham. Uh, Tim Eldridge is not here today. Uh, he is from Effingham. We have Charlene Seibel from Wolfboro. Dr. Jim Manning from Brookfield. Wendy Fenderson from New Durham. We have James Pittman from Effingham. He's also the vice chair of the school board. We have Jack Widmer from Tuftonboro. He is the chairman of the school board. We have the superintendent of schools, Kathleen Cuddy Egberg. We have uh, Chris Bolt as uh, school district council today. We have Kathy Oblinas, who's our business administrator. Linda Murphy, school board secretary. And rounding out the field uh, at the head table is Michelle Capone, who is the school district clerk. Now, we also have Caitlin Murphy uh, right here. I've appointed her to be the assistant moderator uh, today, she served as moderator last year. She's an attorney in our office and lives in Wolfboro. <clears throat> Before we delve into any substantive matters, I would like to dispense with a few preliminary uh, issues. Number one, there may be a few people in the, the uh, audience that are not registered voters, and although we're more than happy to have you observe democracy in action, I would like to remind you that you are guests of the district and you may not vote. If you do vote, that does constitute a misdemeanor. I'm therefore confident that we will receive your utmost cooperation today. Out of curiosity, how many of you are not registered voters? Do you raise your hand? So we have just one, two, three. Uh, just a few. Gluttons for punishment, obviously. Um, so the purpose of today's meeting is in part to explain, discuss, and debate uh, those uh, articles that we legally can, but the ultimate purpose of today's meeting is to determine the form of the articles that will appear on the warrant in March. So we're not going to vote today on the substance of any articles. Again, we'll do that on March 8th um, in your respective towns. Again, we're just here to determine the form. Now, there's eight articles this year that we will vote on. Article 1 regards the election of school board members and offices, and that won't be discussed today. You'll just simply vote for those candidates they put their name in. We do have two contested races for the at-large position in alphabetical order. We have Brody Deshays and Jessica Williams are running for that position. And then for the Effingham position, incumbent Jim Pitt Pittman is running again, and he's being challenged by Nathaniel Nate Williams. I wish all the candidates the best of luck, and thank you for uh, offering to serve. So there are seven articles that we will discuss uh, today. Those are found at the back of the annual report on pages 39 and, and 40. And I'll read each one as we go through. Uh, the main budget, which is Article 8, uh, can be found on uh, pages 36 through 38. Now, if anyone desires to amend an article or make a subset of motion, it's always appreciated if you would keep it as simple as possible. Uh, I do not permit amendments to amendments on the floor at the same time. And because we operate under SB 2, uh, there are three procedural twists. Number one, you cannot kill an article by tabling or passing over it. Number two, you can't amend the default budget because that amount is set by law. And then three, more articles whose wording is prescribed, prescribed by law cannot be amended. And no warrant article can be amended to eliminate the subject matter. You can change dollar amounts even to zero. You can change intent. You can change impact, but you cannot delete the subject matter. Let me also establish just a few other procedural uh, rules um, <clears throat> regarding the conduct of the meeting, and they're the same that we've had in the past. Number one, that I do not follow nor adhere to any particular parliamentary set of rules. 
Number two, I always uh, recognize the submitter of a particular article, and since all seven articles this year were submitted by the school board, I'll recognize a school board member to address those articles first before opening it up for any discussion. For those of you that do speak, we have a microphone right here in the middle of the room, and if there's anybody in the, uh, the back room, there's a microphone there as well. Uh, this should be a fairly short meeting, since there'll be no final votes uh, taken today. Uh, you just vote in your own respective towns, and the uh, time and place is at the back of the annual report as to where your polling hours are. I will read each and every article before it is uh, discussed for the benefit of those that don't have an annual report or are listening on the radio or on, on the, the television. And after an article is read, it does not need to be moved or seconded. We'll just jump right into discussion. And if anything is voted on today, we need just a simple majority for that article to pass or fail or that amendment to pass or fail. And after a reasonable period of time has elapsed regarding the discussion of any particular article, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion to terminate debate or call the question, which I treat as synonymous. Um, but I always waver on the side of letting people speak. We only do this once a year, and uh, I encourage you to speak your mind if you'd like to. Uh, for those of you that have cell phones, this would be a great time to take them out just to make sure that they are off so they don't disrupt the meeting as we proceed forward. And you're also all aware that various motions can be made prior to a motion to adjourn which may alter a previous uh, vote, and I therefore encourage you all to stay until a motion to adjourn actually passes. Now, you can prevent or restrict, I should say, rediscussion of an article or a motion that has been previously considered by passing a motion to restrict reconsideration, and should that uh, motion to restrict reconsideration pass, then you can leave uh, with confidence that we will not revisit that issue today. Just as a side note, I've been reading that last paragraph for over a decade. Uh, but prior to that, I didn't quite read it right. And I had a moderator came up to me about a decade ago and told me that there was a subtle difference in the law in what I was saying. And uh, uh, I went back and reread it, and by, by all means, he was, he was correct. And I'm talking about Dan Barnard right here, who's the Tuftonboro moderator. And uh, this is Dan's last meeting as the moderator of Tufton Borough, so just a shout out to you for 20 years of service. We greatly appreciate it, and, and I appreciate you keeping an eye on me and the school district and helping us along, Dan. <clears throat> so finally, we only discussed the subject matter of issues that appeared in the warrant. It would be unfair and inappropriate to vote or discuss on any new substantive matters which do not appear in the warrant. If there's been no notice, then we won't discuss that today. And those are basically the same rules that we've had uh, in the past that have served us well and that we will use today. So just finally, uh, March 8th is election day. That's when we all need to vote. It is a long day for poll workers in Wolfboro. We are open from 8 in the morning to 7 at night. And of course, there's preliminary work that needs to be done, and then we need to count the ballots for all six towns, so anything you can do to help your poll workers on election day, have your license ready or whatever identification you have, no matter what, you'll be able to vote, but if you can expedite the process, it's always appreciated. So uh, lastly, it has been a tradition since 1988 that the chairman of the school board deliver a state of the school report. I therefore recognize Jack Widmer, chairman, to deliver that report. Jack? Thank you, Randy. As many of you know, in December, our communities had a heartbreaking loss with the passing of Krista Abair. Krista had many talents and wonderful qualities. First and foremost, she was a child advocate. She dedicated her life to teaching. Most of her teaching career was in the Governor Wentworth School District, where she was a much loved teacher, coach, and colleague. For the past three years, she continued to contribute to the lives of children as a member of the Governor Wentworth Regional School Board. She will be sorely missed by our board and all who knew her. Please join me in remembering Krista with a moment of silence.
Thank you for that moment of remembrance, and thank you for taking the time to join us today for our deliberative session. <clears throat> Though things in our state and throughout the world continue to impact, to be impacted by the global pandemic, I am thankful for the ongoing commitment to our school community and doing what we can to support our students, their families, and our staff. As I have said on several occasions, we may not always agree on the outcomes we have arrived at in uh, for the past couple of years, but I know that everyone's intentions have been in the right place. In that spirit, I look forward to sharing some highlights from across the district as I have traditionally done. For too long now, we have been faced with great challenges beyond what any of us could have imagined. And so today, I look forward to celebrating some great successes. Since our school doors opened, uh, were closed, I'm sorry, were closed in March of 2020, to today with our schools once again engaged in in-person learning, we have been tasked with learning to pivot quickly as new information and guidance have been provided to us. That continues to be the case, and I remain proud to serve this district and proud of all that we have done together. I especially want to recognize and thank our talented staff, teachers, and administrators for the tireless work done on behalf of our students each day and to the parents, grandparents, and guardians of our students. We really are all in this together. As the morning goes on, we will review the state of our schools, the rationale for each article on the warrant, and the district's proposed budget for fiscal 2023. At this time, I'd like to begin with the state of the schools. While we know the challenges our staff and students have continued to face day to day, there is a collective can-do attitude in all of our schools. The high school is no exception. Students have shown great resilience as much-loved traditions and celebrations had to be reinvented and teachers had to explore new and different ways of achieving their goals to meet student needs. And they have done just that. We know it, it, it is still a long, perhaps bumpy road ahead of us as we reset our course on the other side of the pandemic. But I am heartened by the perseverance of our administration, staff, and students. There is so much that is gratifying to see as a board when we consider what the student body has been able to accomplish during this past year. Classes are in full swing again with some adaptations that needed to be made but our talented staff is making it happen. And with the return of so many beloved traditions, even reinvented, students can experience what the high school experience has to offer. College fairs were held again, Spirit Week was a great success, and homecoming, with a twist, brought students outside and enjoyed nude activities. Mr. Burns and Mr. Gothier even enjoyed a chance to play their guitars together. Friday night football games under the lights, concessions being open, a playoff soccer game, these are all things that seem to be, seem so much a part of the normal rhythm of Kingswood Regional High School. Yet there is a renewed appreciation for all of that. I know I'm uh, truly thankful for all that has gone into doing the very best we can for our students every single day. It has not been easy by any means, and I extend my deepest appreciation to our school communities. As you may know, the board has been committed to enhancing science, technology, engineering, and math, best known as STEM education for many years now. Robotics teams around the district were thriving prior to the pandemic, and they are making their way back to uh, being as robust as before. The Kingswood Regional High School team, named The Resistance, is led by math teacher Jim Sidemer. Uh, he, he shared with us that it was a little tough at first to get started back up for 2021 school year after the remain, uh, remainder of the previous season was canceled. Despite the team being much smaller than normal, they successfully competed in the 2021 all virtual competition, completing their sixth robot, Base Cannon 2.0, pictured here. In their current 21-22 season, 
the resistance has come back strong. With 20 young men and women who are mostly new members, they are currently building their seventh robot to compete in the Southern New Hampshire District Competition, which will be held March 3rd through March 5th, and the Pease District Competition, running March 31st to April 2nd. The resistance welcomes Chris Nelson as their newest mentor. Chris is the tech drawing teacher at Kingswood and offers a wealth of knowledge of CAD, engineering, and 3D printing to the team. I continue to be so impressed with what our students are able to do through the district's robotics programs. And I congratulate and thank the staff and students who are all who have participated in it all. <clears throat> After a long hiatus, it was so wonderful to have a musical performance back at the Art Center. This past November, the wonderful talents of our student performers from the middle and high school, along with the technical crew, costume designers, and the set and prop teams put together a fantastic performance of Mamma Mia. All of this was made possible under Scott Giesler's direction, and I congratulate him for this tremendous production. The performance was absolutely terrific, and I was also fortunate to, to, enough to join some of my fellow board members for a special behind the curtain tour prior to the evening performance we saw. It included a guided pre-show peek at the production, including sound checks, makeup, costuming, and technical booth preparations. It was a special night for us, and it was a wonderful opportunity to see everything that goes into making our theater productions so special and successful. I couldn't have been more impressed with the talent and heart that went into this production of Mamma Mia. It was certainly a performance to remember. This past year, our student athletes were able to continue participating in their respective programs all three seasons with protocols in place. Athletic Director Aaron House shared that the theme of resilience has really been behind our student athletes and coaches this past year. Coaches have worked hard to give our student athletes the best experience they can during these challenging times. And our student athletes have continued to bring their determination, skill, and team spirit with them. For so many of our students, athletics is a motivator, a passion, and an outlet like, no, like none other. We as a board are proud of how our student athletes have persevered and celebrated the spirit and skill they bring to their sports of choice. We are especially proud of how they, they represent themselves and their school community. And speaking of being proud, I am also happy to share annual updates about our Scholar Athlete Awards. 23 student athletes have been nominated for this award again this year. Congratulations to each of them. The impressive community service efforts of our high school students continues to make all of us proud. Kingswood Regional High School's Student Council was able to run their successful Wish Upon a Star program once again. Kingswood students and staff brought in close to 150 gifts for families in need across the Governor Wentworth communities. At Thanksgiving, the students were able to donate a total of 35 food baskets throughout our school communities, including 15 to the Wolfboro Food Pantry. Following the devastating tornado in Kentucky, the Current Issues class collaborated with the National Honor Society and Peer Outreach for a State of Hope project that raised over $750 for the American Red Cross. Despite the pandemic, homecoming, which I mentioned earlier, was a great success as student council hosted an outdoor school assembly with school-wide activities and games. <clears throat> the events were capped off with an outdoor homecoming dance with close to 450 students in attendance, which is the largest number the school can remember. I know that the student council is now planning for the winter carnival and I'm sure they will be equally creative and successful. This year, the National Honor Society changed to a fall induction to allow the newly inducted seniors to have a full year to participate in activities. 
The group included 25 new members this fall. In October, the organization teamed up with Crescent Lake PTO to help organize a trunk or treat before th Halloween. Along with running the games, the National Honor Society brought in a Jaws-themed boat. Later in the fall, they teamed up with Peer Outreach to pick up trash around, uh, from around the campus. And I'm sure this was a very rewarding experience for all involved to know they were helping maintain our beautiful grounds. In December, they restarted their Kingswood and Kids Saturday Mentorship Program that was, able, that was not able to run last year. I understand that the response has been amazing with 20 to 40 students from Crescent Lake School attending each Saturday morning from 9 to 10.30 a.m. I am told that both the high school students and elementary students have really enjoyed the opportunity to laugh, play, and be kids again. Nights Against, Against Hunger it is an organization that we are fortunate to have supporting students who are experiencing food insecurity. They are an active group that has made a truly positive impact at both the middle and high school. In addition to seeing some of the operational side of things on the slides here, you will, you will see some highlights from the annual Christmas party that is hosted by Knights Against Hunger. This tradition began early on in their history to recognize the work of the students with different abilities and their contributions to the Knights Against Hunger. Students from the Life Skills Program fill the bags, bag orders and pack them weekly for distribution. This makes uh, Knights Against Hunger a unified service organization that so many in the school community benefit from. In addition to Knights Against Hunger, uh, which serves our middle and high school, N68 Hours of Hunger Wolfboro Area Chapter has been serving preschool through grade six students, providing weekend meals all year round in each of our six communities. The program is run completely by dedicated volunteers in our communities in collaboration with coordinators and volunteers in each school. Delivery of food to each site is provided with the help of our transportation department. Over 120 children in our six elementary schools receive the food bags every Friday and includes seven child-friendly meals and snacks for the 68 hours between leaving school on Friday and returning on Monday morning. During remote learning last spring, our food service department provided breakfast and lunch for all students five days a week for those wishing to participate. In addition to that, N68 Hours provided weekend food bags to over 200 children each week. The coordination among our food service department, transportation department, N68 Hours, and Nights Against Hunger was nothing short of amazing and I want to extend my deepest gratitude to all who have been involved in supporting our students this way. Thank you. With Bruce Farr's retirement last June, the Lakes Region Technology Center welcomed new principal Kathy Tetro in July, and she sure hit the ground running. As we know, career technical education today is more important than ever. Statewide and nationally, we find ourselves in a struggle to find employees with adequate skills to meet the demands of our economy. I certainly feel that the Lakes Region Technology Center continues to be, a, continues to be a tremendous asset for our students, as well as those from the surrounding districts of Moultonboro, Prospect Mountain, and Farmington. The center is making efforts to prepare our students to meet those demands in areas of greatest need, healthcare, computer networking, education, manufacturing, auto and mechanical industries, construction trades, agriculture and environmental sciences, hospitality, consumer sciences, marketing, and media communications. The goals have centered around giving students the opportunities they need to be successful and meeting their goals in pursuit of employable, employability skills. With those goals in mind, 
The staff is proud of the fact that they have been able to operate the center as close to fully operational as possible and to keep students and staff safe and healthy. <clears throat> In October of this school year, LRTC installed their Career Technical Education Student Organization Leaders, better known as CTSOs, which allow students to participate in state conferences. This was a welcome return to tradition for our students. And speaking of returning to, to, to traditions, uh, Chef Brito and the culinary arts students were welcomed back to Cook's Corner on WMUR-TV and LRTC worked with Kingswood and Prospect Mountain to hold a very successful career fair in November. Nightwatch resumed their production and broadcasting in Mr. Giesler's multimedia class, providing news and school-wide information. As part of the collabor uh, uh, Collaborate to Educate program with community partners at Maker's Mill Gala, Many months of work with the architect, builders, and Josh Arnold have allowed the precision manufacturing and construction trade students to work toward putting together a schedule for manufacturing and installing their parts of the construction project on site. This has allowed students to bo in both programs to experience hands-on, site-based, authentic work-based learning experiences, which is a source of pride for the center and for us as a board. Moving on to the middle school. As our community knows, Kingswood Riddle Regional Middle School is the place where students come from all communities and they come together for the first time along with Middleton students. These two impactful years before high school are intended to not only offer robust academics to foster their achievement, but to strengthen work habits during those adolescent years. These, include, these habits include uh, collaboration, perseverance, and resilience, a common theme across the district. In the highlights I'm sharing today, I hope you can see the spirit of our middle school students coming through. Teachers and staff work diligently to ensure that a well-rounded educational experience is offered providing access to unique experiences like an architecture class offered during a learning lab where students build scaled models. Staff continues to work on providing instructional approaches that meet the needs of middle school learners and serve as the critically important bridge between elementary school and high school. Some spirited highlights include some seventh and eighth grade uh, chorus students who were able to participate in caroling in downtown Wolfboro this past December. I know that there has been great, a great deal of excitement uh, to seeing the band and chorus classes back in action and continuing to grow. With the support of local businesses and, and individuals, the student council members were able to fill 28 Thanksgiving baskets this year in addition to the high school's contribution to the communities we serve. The Student Council also donated proceeds from their Halloween costume dress-up day to their chosen charity, which was the Lakes Region Humane Society in Ossipee. And in athletics, the middle school football team had a very successful season where they were, where there was support for our student athletes on and off the field. Additionally, both the boys and girls soccer teams had winning seasons, representing Kingswood Middle School with pride. <clears throat> the strong foundation built across each of our elementary schools, in addition to our sister school, Middleton, Middleton Elementary School, leads to the success of our students in the middle school and high school. <clears throat> the challenges of these past 23 months have not changed our goal of maintaining academic integrity. We know too well the impact that lost in-person instructional time has had on our students, and we are fully committed to doing all we can to continue to support the needs of all students. I know that the administration is focusing on summer programming to be offered to all interested students, similar to what we did last year. 
That is just one example of how we are focusing on the unfinished learning that was brought about during remote and hybrid learning. I know my fellow board members join me in looking forward to welcoming students back to our monthly meetings <clears throat> to see all of the wonderful learning that is taking place. There are so many areas that we enjoy learning about, <clears throat> whether it is a mini performance, hearing a piece of poetry, a great math challenge, a social emotional learning resource, or an art activity. I assure you, we very much look forward to that again. Until that day comes, I am happy to offer a few highlights from across our six elementary schools. As I shared earlier, a can-do attitude is everywhere this year, and our elementary schools are happily demonstrating it. Over the summer, students at Carpenter School made a paper link for each book they read. The, link, uh, the links were all joined once school began, and it extended from the side of the building all the way to the middle of the playground. For the first day of school, staff welcomed students back this fall by decorating the front lawn with hearts, which had each student's name written. The sign that greets all in front of the, uh, of the door reads, we love our carpenter kids. Each class day begins with a morning message, welcoming the students, setting the tone for the day, and reinforcing academic skills. Some of those academic school skills include a STEM project or practicing liter literacy skills at a center. Academics is interwoven with traditions like the Halloween parade and community service, such as donating over 800 items to the Life Ministry Food Pantry in December. December was a special month too, as the students participated in a school-wide reenactment of the Polar Express, where the children enjoyed having their boarding passes uh, punched at the Polar Express, listening to the stories being read, and enjoying hot chocolate. These are the things that our students remember and it's heartwarming to know our staff is making it all happen. At Crescent Lake, Otter Student Council students uh, joined Carpenter in the same spirit of giving back by delivering over 1,500 food items to the Life Ministries Food Pantry. And fourth grade students participated in the act of giving during the 2021 Thanksgiving food drive. The fall festival was held once again where students participated in cross grade level teams to compete uh, to complete a collaborative art project. Prior to the fall festival, fifth grade students worked on team building. After school activities are in full swing as well, such as the after school uh, fall crafts club, students were able to take advantage of being outdoors for learning when the weather was a, a bit warmer. As winter made its appearance, students enjoyed skiing at Gunstock during winter sports or ice skating at Pop Whalen Arena. Of course, some good old-fashioned sledding at recess never gets old either. Our Crescent Lake School One Wheel Wonders unicycling team even braved the cold to perform at the Wolfboro Holiday Parade. Students at Effingham continue to enjoy two outdoor classrooms when weather allows, and also continues to enjoy a partnership with the Green Mountain Conservation Group that is more than 11 years strong. As safety allows, guest teachers share their knowledge and passion with students as it prepares to col a, the collection of water samples within the Osprey Lake watershed. This data is collected and presented at the group's annual meeting and shared with all communities within the Osprey Lake watershed. Students were able to test for microplastics this year using new microscopes. Hopefully the board members will get a chance to see them soon. Aside from new microscopes, students continue to utilize Chromebooks for learning. They are using them to record themselves reading aloud or drafting a piece of writing, working on individualized learning activities, and creating digital art. With direction from our curriculum director, director and through work with the math coach, 
Teachers are learning multiple techniques for math instruction across the district. By design, activities are accessible to students engaged at all levels, and it has been fantastic to see the excitement and growth over these past several years. We are optimistic that the two-year grant-funded math project manager positions will have a significant impact on student achievement. New Durham School continues to highlight the importance of social emotional well-being, including a multi-year partnership with the New Hampshire Department of Education's iSocial Initiative, which is a, a play-based kindergarten experience. In addition to this initiative, students are engaged in responsive classroom practices. The arts are alive and well at New Durham School. Students in grades kindergarten through third grade participated in a virtual music version of The Penguin Saves Christmas, while students in second grade worked with Ms. Mr. Stasiak in art class to combine the story Balloons Over Broadway, some of their favorite literary characters, the Macy's Day Parade, and mathematical thinking to create a scaled depiction of New Durham. With all of this, they, they then created a video showing their creative project put all together. A group of the pictures show, a group of pictures show uh, Junie B. Jones and Arlo from The Good Dinosaur floating by the school. Staff and students also enjoyed taking part in the well-loved tradition of the Halloween parade through town. You will, see so, you will see some slides that show scenes from the full and fun summer with Camp Invention, which hosted 36 students from grades one through six, in addition to a well-attended summer school program. Osprey Central School also enjoyed a return to their Halloween parade going through downtown Center Osprey this past October. One costume that, was, that has stayed the course is that of Osprey's wild cat mascot, pictured in the upper right of this slide. Sixth graders were invited to try out to represent Osprey Central School as the wild cat. The mascot attends all school-wide functions and helps keep spirits high. In keeping with creative themes, theme and costumes, fourth grade students dressed for the annual Colonial Day celebration and took part in activities which included ink writing, making applesauce, and outdoor games. This is a day that is a time-honored tradition. Students take, uh, take advantage of the outdoor classroom space as often as possible and I'm sure they'll be right back out there once the spring weather finds us. Outdoor learning also took place during a fourth grade field trip to White Lake State Park, which combined STEM and social studies learning for a fun educational experience. Osseby third graders were able to visit the, Osseby, the Center Osseby Fire Station during Fire Prevention Week as part of their fire safety lesson. Two special celebrations were highlighted for Ossipi. One in the fall when students, staff, and community members completed another successful color run together, joined in December with a socially distanced but truly special evening of the Ossipi Central School Chorus performing in their annual holiday concert. Tufton Borough Central School has celebrated a return to some beloved traditions like many of our schools. For some of our students, that meant a chance to work on art projects again or participating in fire safety day with our fire department. For others, it was participating in hiking club again and enjoying be out in, being out in nature together. Sixth graders loved the chance to be at Camp Mara Vista and participating in a variety of outdoor games and activities with one another. Tufton Borough students were also excited to get back on the slopes at King Pine with winter activities back again. I hear that the first graders uh, might say that the gingerbread house creation was a highlight for them. It is the comfort and excitement of time-honored traditions that remind us it is worth the time and effort that goes into making them happen, especially this past year.
This year, the district has started the, transformation, the transition from using the Northwest Evaluation Association's Measures of Academic Progress, or MAP test, to Edmonton's Exact Path Diagnostics and Learning Paths. While the NWEA MAP assessments have long provided a dearth of information on student readiness, we needed a program that was more user-friendly and that provided teachers and their students with actionable next steps for remediation and practice. This was especially necessary in light of the challenges that the pandemic presented to learning. Exact Paths Adaptive Diagnostic not only provides teachers with easily accessible information on their students' progress on academic skills, but it creates an individualized learning path for each student to better address where a student is in the learning process and moving them forward. Exact Path also provides administrative reports that allows us to look at curriculum trends across grade levels so as to provide appropriate professional development resources, and other supports. Across the district, we have always been so grateful for our volunteers. PTOs and volunteers, act, act, activities, and selfless, selflessness engage with our school communities to raise funds to supplement programs, chaperone, assist in classrooms, donate materials, and assist on special projects. Our PTOs and volunteers have always been significant partners in our work. While volunteering had to be modified over the past year, I want to thank all of those who reached out to the schools to offer their support, donations, or thoughts. I always want to thank the many individuals who work tirelessly in our communities to support the needs of our families. Though so much has been so different over the past 23 months, there has been a lot of support for one another. I look forward to the day of welcoming back all of our volunteers across the district. Before closing my, re my remarks, <clears throat> I want to take a moment, as I did last year, to express my gratitude on behalf of the board during these extraordinary times. Thank you to the Transportation Department. It is, not, it is no easy feat to coordinate all of the routes, which vary on any given day. The complexity of covering transportation in a district of our size is a challenge in the best of circumstances. What has been coordinated and carried out by all of our departments is nothing short of amazing. Thank you to our custodians and building and maintenance teams for their hours and efforts to keep our buildings safe and clean. Thank you to our food service staff for keeping our children nourished and for working so tirelessly behind the scenes to do so. Thank you to our school secretaries for their ongoing uh, efforts to, uh, to coordinate and carry out the multifaceted changes at the building levels. And thank you to our teachers, our nurses, specialists, our support staff, and our administrators for doing all that needs to be done, even when it seems overwhelming. And thank you to our families and our community members for understanding that we continue to face one of the most challenging times of our lives. I believe we all join in wanting nothing but the best for our students today and in every day to come. That concludes my State of the School speech. Randy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jack. Uh, we'll jump right into Article 2, which I'll read. To see if the Governor Wentworth Regional School District will vote to approve the cost items included in the collective bargaining agreement reached between the Governor Wentworth Regional School Board and the Governor Wentworth Support Staff Association, which calls for the following increases in salaries and benefits at the current staffing levels. For the fiscal year 2023, the estimated increase is $193,860. For the 2024 fiscal year, it's $197,917. And for the 2025 fiscal year, it's $207,381. And further, raise and appropriate the sum of $193,860 for the 2022-2023 fiscal year 
Such sum representing the additional costs attributable to the increase in salaries and benefits required by the new agreement over those that would be paid at the current staffing levels. The school board recommends this appropriation. A majority vote will be required for it to pass in March. You understand that Wendy Fenerson is going to start us off on this, so Wendy, you're up. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this past year and a half has been extremely difficult um, for everyone. Um, the support yet staff has been doing a credible job during these difficult circumstances. We have been very short staff and currently and approximately have 30 positions unfilled and many absences due to illnesses. There are plenty of job openings right now that are paying much more than we are paying our support staff. This is one of the main reasons it's been so difficult to fill these positions. The unemployment rate in the state of New Hampshire is so low, the state is considered to be in full employment. The consumer price index has increased and the state of New Hampshire is approximately 6.2%. We appreciate the hard work of our support staff need to make our, their compensation more competitive with the surrounding area. And the additional goal we in, was to increase the amount of the support staff contributes towards the cost of their insurance. In order to give our support staff an a reasonable rate increase, the increase to their portion of insurance, well, having them end up taking home less in their paycheck, we discussed a three-year agreement. Year one with a 5% wage increase and, and, and an insurance co-pay of 4%. Year two was a 4.5 increase with the insurance copay at 4.5 increase. In year three, a 4.5% wage increase with a 5% insurance copay. With this agreement, everyone will see an increase of some kind in their paycheck, although they will be paying more towards the cost of their insurance. Thank you. It's, sorry, I thought it shut off. Um, our bus drivers, food service staff, paraeducators, and, and maintenance staff, custodial staff, secretarial staff, and, and paraeducators make up all of our support staff. They have done a wonderful job for our students, especially in the past two years, where they have been filling in when they are needed, and they have been struggling to help us with our severe staff shortage. We could not operate our schools without them and we hope that you will support us with these article with this article. Thank you. Is there any discussion regarding article two? Seeing none we'll move on to article three which is really just a housekeeping article. Shall the Governor Wentworth Regional School District, if Article 2 is defeated, authorize the governing body to call one special meeting at its option to address Article 2 cost items only? A majority vote will be required for this to pass in March. Is there any discussion regarding Article 3? And I understand, Wendy, you're going to say a couple things on that. I'm sorry, I'm like not good with this. We hope that the voters will adopt this a re regional contract, this reasonable contract, settlement proposed for our support staff in Article 3. However, should the Article 3 fail, the adoption of Article 4 authorizes the school board to open up negotiations with our teachers and bring the voters a new proposal to consider. There is no cost associated with adopting this article. Thank you. Is there any discussion regarding Article 3? Seeing none, we'll move on to Article 4. To see if the Governor Wentworth Regional School District will vote to approve the cost items included in the collective bargaining agreement reached between the Governor Wentworth Regional School Board and the Governor Wentworth Administrative Team, which calls for the following increases in salaries and benefits at the current staffing levels. For the fiscal year 2023, the estimated increase would be $47,664. For the 2024 Fiscal year, it would be $53,660. And for the 2025 fiscal year, it would be 53907 
and further to raise and appropriate the sum of $47,664 for the 2022-2023 fiscal year, such sums representing the additional costs attributable to the increases in salaries and benefits required by the new agreement over those that would be uh, paid at current staffing levels. The school board recommends this appropriation. A majority vote is required. And uh, Jack, are you going to address this one? All right, so you're up. Hello? Yes? Okay, good. thank you. This has also been the year for collective bargaining with the administrative team. Our school administrators have done a terrific job during these challenging times. We have a seasoned, competent, and very caring administrative team, all of whom have been committed to the district for a number of years. This type of loyalty and commitment is not the case in many other districts. Most of our administrators started out in teaching or other positions within the district. Negotiations with this group had two goals from the school board's point of view. To keep salaries competitive with other schools in the state because we want to retain our administrators and to increase the insurance copay for the administrators. We have done that, we've done that with this agreement. Year one is a 3% wage increase and an increase from 3 to 4% for the insurance copay. Year two is a 3% wage increase and an increase to 4.5% copay for insurance. And year three is a 3% wage increase with an increase to 5% copay for insurance. As new administrators come into the district, they will have a 10% copay for insurance. We are fortunate to have the administrative team that we have. These administrators have also gone above and beyond what might be expected in their jobs each day in order to keep our schools open this year. Looking at the administrators' salaries in the region, our administrators are compensated less well than some in the region and better than others. In most cases, comparably uh, when, when you take the type and size of the school in, in, into consideration. Our approach to wages has been to be competitive with the surrounding area, but not at the top. We know these are not easy jobs and hope that a fair salary along with positive culture and excellent working conditions within the district, provides an incentive for our very capable administrators to remain with us. I urge you to support this article. Is there any discussion regarding Article 4? Moving on to Article 5, Shall the Governor Wentworth Regional School District, if Article 4 is defeated, authorize the governing body to call one special meeting at its option to address Article 4 cost items only? Majority vote is required. Any discussion on Article 5? Uh, Jack? We hope that voters will adopt the reasonable contract settlement proposed in Article 4. However, should the article fail, Adoption of Article 5 authorizes the school board to open negotiations with our administrators and bring voters a new proposal to consider. There is no cost associated with adopting this article. Is there any discussion regarding Article 5? Seeing none, we'll move on to Article 6 to see if the Governor Wentworth Regional School District will vote to raise and appropriate up to the sum of $60,000 to be added to the Turf Field Capital Reserve Fund previously established, and furthermore, to name the school board as agents to expend the sum to come from the June 30, 2022 fund balance available for transfer on July 1 of 2022, no amount to be raised from taxation. The school board recommends that this, uh, this appropriation and a majority vote will be required in order for it to pass in March. Is there any discussion on Article 6? And uh, Jim, you're going to handle this one, I understand. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and uh, good morning, everyone. Each year for the past several years, we've presented a turf field capital reserve warrant article. The capital reserve was established to avoid the district having the full expen expense of replacing a turf field all at once. The life expectancy of a turf field is 10 to 12 years, at a cost of approximately $750,000 to replace. Currently, we have approximately $650,000 in reserve. 
When this fiscal year is at an end, we hope to add the $60,000 from this year's Warren article to bring the total to approximately $710,000. We've been able to extend the life of the turf to 15 years through meticulous care. With the continued support of this Warren article, we should have the full cost of the replacement in 2024 when it will be needed without asking taxpayers for additional appropriations. I urge you to support this article. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Is there any discussion regarding Article 6? Seeing none, we'll move on to Article 7. Shall the Governor Wentworth Regional School District raise and appropriate the sum of $200,000 for repairs and improvements of building and grounds at the Kingswood Regional High School, Kingswood Regional Middle School, Lakes Region Technology Center, Kingswood Arts Center, Carpenter School, Crescent Lake School, Effingham Elementary School, New Durham School, Osby Central School, Tuftonboro Central School, and the SAU 49 Transportation Facility. This is recommended uh, by the, the school board. The majority vote will be required in order for it to pass uh, in, uh, in March. Is there any discussion regarding Article 7? And uh, Jack, you're up on this one. Each year, the board puts forth the building and maintenance warrant article for capital improvements. It is varied between one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand dollars. In the years when it was a, when it when it has been one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, we invariably have projects that are not completed and need to be considered the following year. This is the case this year. This warrant article includes the funds for three compressor replacements at the high school middle school, and the technology center, carpeting replacement in Ossipee in several classrooms, window replacement at Carpenter School, and sidewalk replacement at Ossipee and Effingham. Our quotes and estimates for all of the capital improvements needed comes to $243,455. With the $150,000 that you, our voters, approved last year, we were able to complete a significant number of important projects, beginning with a significant repair of Carpenter front School's front steps. On this slide, you can see the pictures of the stairs before and during the project. Here in this photo, you can see the beautifully repaired sta uh, stairways. In addition to the repairs to Carpenter's staircase, a significant project was completed at New Durham School with the replacement of the sidewalk. Here you can see the before and during photos. Here are photos of the completed sidewalk project, uh, which I am sure you will agree gives New Durham a whole new look from the outside. The solarium at New Durham School was also in much need of replacement. Here in these photos, you can see just why. This was a very involved project, as you can see from the work during the replacement. The completion of the project enhances this part of the building as much as the sidewalk does in the front of the building. What a difference this makes for New Durham School. Additional projects that were completed by our maintenance department include some representations you see here, which include inst install installment of the voice over IP phone system, commonly known as VoIP system, two new cameras at Ossipee Central School, a compressor replacement on the heat pump system at the Art Center, as well as replacement of the actuator at the, for the HVA unit there. The maintenance department also installed new Promethean boards throughout the district, providing state-of-the-art instructional resources for our classrooms. This spring, a pass-through window will also be installed at both the high school and Ossipee Central School. Another project completed over the summer by the maintenance department is shown here with a before and after of the Ossipee Central School basketball court. What a difference. In addition to the basketball court upgrade at Ossipee Central School, a new exterior scoreboard was also installed. 
Here you can see two painting projects completed at Osabi Central School. One is the repainted rear exterior of the building, and the second one is the, is, is in, is the maintenance shed. Other painting projects were also completed at Tuftonboro Central School, including the main hallway from the gym to the cafeteria. Across the district, a variety of other hallways and classrooms were patched and repainted also, keeping them looking like new. The maintenance department was also able to install new fencing around the AC condensing unit at Effingham School, shown here. We are very fortunate to have been able to complete so many projects over the past year, and I appreciate the hard work of all those who put their time and skill into accomplishing these projects. I'm very proud of how well maintained our facilities are, and I want to thank, also want to thank you, the taxpayers, for supporting uh, the, for your support that allows us to maintain them at the levels that we do. Now, looking at future projects. I'd like to share some of the future capital improvement projects which will continue to allow us to address significant repairs across the district. We have several top priorities for fiscal year 2023, including a multi-stack compressor replacement at the Kingswood Complex and four window replacements at New Durham School. Other capital improvement projects that are high on the priority list across the district include carpet replacements at Ossipee Central School. Another priority on our list is the repair of several sidewalks across the district, a few of which you can see here pictured, which include Ossipee, Effingham, and Crescent Lake. The roof over the uh, kitchen at Tuftonboro Central School, highlighted in yellow on this slide, is another high priority for future projects. These are some significant projects that we have on this list, as well as secondary priorities. I cannot emphasize enough how important your support of these projects is and allows us to be proactive in addressing the needs of our facilities before they become urgent and more costly. And finally, each year when we present the capital improvement articles, we do a comparison of the cost of maintaining our schools to the cost of maintaining the average home. An annual cost of repairs of $200,000 for approximately 640,000 square feet of district property is comparable to home repairs of $422 for an 1,800 square foot home. This is quite a bargain. I urge you to protect your assets and vote yes on this article. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Is there any discussion on Article 7? Seeing none, we'll move on to the last substantive article, Article 8. Shall the Governor Wentworth Regional School District raise and appropriate as an operating budget, not including appropriations by special warrant articles and other appropriations voted separately, the amount set forth on the budget posted with the warrant or as amended by vote of the first session for the purposes set forth therein, totaling $57,762,625. Should this article be defeated, the default budget shall be $57,328,983, which is the same as last year with certain adjustments required by a previous action of the Governor Wentworth Regional School District or by law, or the governing body may <clears throat> hold one special meeting in accordance with the provisions of RSA 40, 13, 10, and 16 to take up the issue of a revised operating budget only. Note this Warren article, operating budget does not include appropriations requested in any other of the Warren articles. The school board recommends uh, this uh, appropriation. And uh, Jack, you're up on this one again. I'd like to start with an overview of the ESSER funds, also known as Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds. They are COVID-related emergency funds from the federal government to help reopen and keep schools open across the nation. The funds must be used for activities and projects that are related to COVID and acceptable under the grant guidelines. These grants and the specific grant activities were discussed extensively at our June 7, 2021 school board meeting. Priorities were established for use of these funds. These are the priorities we set. First, student safety and well-being 
Uh, next is addressing learning loss and improving student, student achievement. And third, we are considering enhancing our HVA systems for student health and safety and as an investment in our schools that will help defray costs down the road. The funds are available in three phases. ESSER 1, or the Corona Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, CARES, was the first phase for the funding. These funds were to purchase personal protective equipment, plexiglass, Chromebooks, software for remote instruction and meetings, cleaning supplies, tuition for remote learning programs, and nursing services. The total amount of the grant is $539,307.27. All of the money is allocated with the exception of $40,000 which will be allocated for projects related to improving student achievement. ESSER II, or the Corona Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, CRRSA, funds have been devoted to increasing the academic achievement of our students. The administrators have been working to do this. Katie Hills, our curriculum director, explained many of these efforts at a prior board meeting. The funds and resources available through this grant will help the schools achieve this in a shorter period of time that would have taken many years to achieve. We are taking a systematic approach to improving student achievement, reviewing our curriculum and instructional practices at all levels. Included in this grant under the umbrella of the New Hampshire Learning Initiative includes consultation and professional development for teachers. As part of this, we have a two-year math positions in each of our schools and a curriculum project manager at the high school, social and emotional learning resources, additional reading materials, funds for more extensive summer programming, and for after-school tutoring and transportation. All of these expenses are calculated for a two-year period. The total of this grant is $2,928,000 $158.41. $423,113 remains unallocated and will be available for additional services for students. ESSER III, or the American Rescue Plan, is the third phase and the largest amount of money. It is this grant that the board is considering using for the third priority. The ESSER III grant is for $6 $582,666 and must be expended by the end of 2024. The grant guidelines expressly identifies heating, ventilation, and cooling systems as a supported activity. We are considering putting the money into our buildings, which will save us from incurring additional costs down the road to upgrade these systems. To provide public input um, on the use of these funds, you can go to the GWRSD website and there's a link to the ESSER grants and you can email any comments that you might have. It is important for the public to know that the grants cannot be used to lower the tax rate. The federal government requires that in order to receive these funds, we must not disproportionately reduce state or local per pupil costs in schools Districts also must not disproportionately reduce the number of full-time staff per pupil in high-need classified schools. These grants are more complex than your typical grants and have a variety of requirements imposed by the federal government, including formulas to ensure we are following the guidelines. There is some flexibility during the grant period to modify the grant activities. For example, if an activity results in some leftover funds, those can be reallocated. However, any unspent funds must, I say again, must be returned to the federal government. We will be utilizing every bit of the money in our district and do not plan on spending a dime back to Washington. Now, now our budget. Unemployment is low in New Hampshire, and there are some encouraging signs for the economic outlook. However, there is also quite a bit of economic uncertainty right now with the threat of inflation. 
Factors from anywhere in the world can have an impact on the economy, positive or negative. Understanding this, the board is bringing forth a frugal budget. The challenge for the board is always to bring forward a budget that provides for the educational needs of our students and is at the same time within the financial ability of the taxpayers to support. To do this, we look very carefully at all aspects of the budget to cut back where we feel we can without sacrificing educational needs of our students. So how do we do this? Budgeting process begins in October with staff members in each school providing the school principal with their budgetary needs. Each administrator submits a budget to the SAU office. The visit administrator and superintendent of schools meets with each school leader to discuss the requests. If there is a large increase in an individual budget, unless there is a special circumstance or very well justified rationale, the administrator is asked to review the budget and reduce it while keeping priorities intact. If any increase remains that does not have a strong justification, a second cut may occur. Personnel requests are made at the same time. Requests for positions may or may not proceed to the Finance Committee, depending on the strength of the rationale outlined, outlining the need for the position. This year we discussed reductions in regular education teaching positions rather than additions. Public meetings to discuss the budget were held on November 16th, 17th, and 18th this year. Following these meetings, additional cuts were made in order to lower the budget further. On January 10th, the school board again discussed the budget and adopted it. Today's deliberative session is the last meeting on the budget before voting. Although total enrollment is for the most part stable, there are some changes in enrollment at some of our schools. Last year's total enrollment was 2,112. This year it's 2,107. The high school enrollment is lower than it was last year. However, the incoming classes over the next two years will likely bring that number back up. Ossipi Central School increased by 19 students. New Durham also increased by 19 students. The largest decrease was at Crescent Lake School with 36 fewer students. And we saw a decrease last year in kindergarten enrollment at Carpenter. We expected to see an increase this year, but did not. These decreases were factored into some staffing decisions we will be discussing. It is unclear if we will see higher enrollment numbers once we are no longer in the middle of this pandemic. <clears throat> Schools are labor-intensive organizations, and wages and benefits make up approximately 78% of the budget. The increase in wages in this budget is less than half of a percent. This includes two new paraeducator positions required by the individual education plans for students with disabilities. It also includes a 30% special education teaching position in Effingham in order to meet the needs of the special education students. Even with these additions, the increase is small because we are eliminating two teaching positions uh, where there, are, there has been a drop in student numbers. Class sizes will still be well below the state recommended recommendations in both schools. The positions will be reduced through attrition due to retirements. The line, item, <clears throat> the line item does not include the Governor Wentworth Support Staff Collective Bargaining Agreement or the Governor Wentworth Administrators Collective Bargaining Agreement. These will be presented in articles and were, and were addressed earlier in this presentation. There are some significant increases that we have no control over, as I have also mentioned earlier. Health insurance is the largest increase at $656,226, or 7.25%. The $210,000 increase for the retirement system, or 4.56%, is also a very significant increase. The decreases you see in these lines are the result of our administrators scouring through each school's expenses to cut back where we could. These are identified with the red stars. 
The one area in which you will see an increase is in health service, the health services line. With the retirement of one of our nurses, who is part of the teacher's CBA, we filled the position with a nurse contracted from the hospital. Since it is a contracted service, it appears in this line rather than the wages. Items related to building maintenance that were requested were also reviewed and cut back as much as possible to offset the repairs and maintenance list that needs to be attended to this year, in addition to the capital improvement list. We have been able to save money in the contracted transportation line by doing these trips ourselves rather than contracting with companies. This was made possible by purchasing a vehicle through grant funds. The work that our IT department did to run cable bringing voice over IP is paying off in a significant reduction in our phone services bill. Here in the second half of the general supplies budget, we continue to see cuts in supplies, gas, heating oil, transportation fuel, books and media, new equipment, and new furniture in order to balance out the increases in some of the other areas. The increase in testing materials is a result of changing to the XPath testing. XPath allows the teachers to drill down to see which, st uh, which standards are not being met and provide suggestions and resources providing the students with additional help to meet those standards. The tuition line represents two thirds of the increase in the general fund. This line is for special education students who for various reasons are placed out of district that may be, they may be in foster children placed in a home in another district, children who when they moved into the district were already in placement or students we have needed to place. This figure is the projection for students who are either already in placement or placement is being discussed. If the placements do not occur, this money is returned to taxpayers. The increase in the replacement of equipment line keeps our Chromebook replacement cycle on target and also includes some teacher laptop replacements as well as replacements in some of our interactive whiteboards. We have been moving to Promethean boards, which are less expensive to, than the smart boards we currently have and don't require additional document cameras or projectors. The increase in the replacement furniture is for tables at the high school and chairs at Ossipi. Both have not been replaced for about 20 years. The operational budget can be characterized in the following ways. Employee expenses, expenses required by law or circumstance, debt, variable expenses, and pay me now or pay me later expenses. The required by law or circumstance category includes items such as insurance, electricity, heating oil, transportation, and special education expenses. Pay now or pay later expenses includes repair and maintenance, building service agreements, and replacements of vehicles. These items, if ignored, will cost taxpayers more than if the spending is done on a timely basis. We have paid off quite a few bonds in recent years, and the only debt remaining is on the Kingswood complex. The variable category represents those expenses over which we have the greatest control. Examples of these items, uh, in the items in this category include general supplies, books and printed materials, computer media software, and equipment. These items have a direct impact on the curriculum and instruction for our students. Since we are a labor intensive organization, it is no surprise that our employee expenses are by far our largest budget category. Districts continue to bear the brunt of the costs of the New Hampshire retirement system passed down to us by requiring districts to pay a higher percentage into the system as they try to remediate the unfunded liability incurred some years ago. It continues to have an impact on this area of the budget. The largest increase in the budget is in the health insurance and rising insurance premiums is something we cannot control. 
What helps the employee area of the budget significantly is that all three uh, employee groups have agreed to continue to pay for greater portions of their insurance premiums. The labor shortage over the past two years has demonstrated how difficult it is to deliver the programs and services we believe students must have without the people available to implement them. Looking at these budget categories, it is easier, easier to see how difficult it is to reduce this budget without also cutting back on what we are able to provide for our students. Over the past several years, having, reduced, uh, having retired the bonds for Effingham, Ossipee, and New Durham, our principal and debt for the Kingswood complex continues to decrease. This coming year's reduction is $92,236. The in interest increases as our principal decreases because we receive less state building aid with the reduction in our principal. The total reduction in the debt service is $6,495 or 0.18%. The revenue budget is impacted this year by the additional state aid we will receive in the form of a state grant. With lower numbers in most New Hampshire schools due to the pandemic, the state created an aid formula that would not penalize districts for lower enrollment. The state aid is based on a complex formula that considers the number of students overall, the number of families receiving free and reduced, special, reduced lunches, special education membership, and other uh, differentiated aid. The increase in revenue will help to keep our taxes lower. This chart shows the potential impact of the budget. As I mentioned when discussing the revenue, we are fortunate this year that the state revised its formula for state aid. We did not see the decrease that we would have seen in state grants with our lower, low, low, lower enrollment that we would have seen without the revision. This helped the tax rate in some of our communities. The differences between 2021-2022 tax rate and the 2022-2023 projected tax rate per thousand is the following. Brookfield increases by $1.82, Effingham $1.30, New Durham 11 cents, Ossipee 87 cents, Tuftonboro actually goes down 17 cents and Wolfboro decreases by 31 cents. When you look at your tax bill, it is important to look at the three types of taxes you are paying. It is also important to compare apples to apples with regards to what you are paying for education, town services, and county services. How that compares to the rest of the state is also, put, uh, also puts a tax, the, your tax bill into perspective. This, this chart provides you with a visual image of where each entity ranks in comparison to others of the same type. In order to consider this, we must look at the full value tax rates that reflect properties at 100% of their value. The New Hampshire Department of Revenue Administration prepares a report titled the Tax Rate Comparison. It lists all New Hampshire towns, cities, and land grants identifying their respective full value tax rates for both local governments and schools. Because, equal, because equalized tax rates cannot be calculated until the tax year is over, the data available runs one year in, in arrears. The information you see is taken from the most recent tax comparison available, which is tax year 2021. The chart provides a visual image for you of where we stand. The 220, 259 New Hampshire communities have been ranked according to tax rate for school, town, and county, and placed in quadrants from the highest tax rate to the lowest, so you can easily spot where each of the three rank. Rather than comparing school districts, town, and counties to each other, this, compare, this compares those entities uh, charged with providing the same functions to the taxpayers, comparing school districts to other school districts, towns with other towns, and counties with other counties. With regard to the school tax, four of the Governor Wentworth communities fall into the lowest half of the ranking. 
two towns, Wolfboro and Tuftonboro, in the lowest quadrant for school taxes. Moving on to the default budget. RSA 40, 40 colon 13, the official ballot law, also known as SB2, determines what is to be included as part of a default budget. A default budget is the amount of the same appropriations as contained in the operating budget authorized the previous year, reduced or increased by obligations mandated by law or previously incurred, such as debt and contracts. One-time expenditures are not included in the default budget. The purpose of presenting a default budget is to give the voters an understanding of what a budget would look like should the proposed operating budget be voted down. The default budget this year is $433,642 lower than the proposed budget. Aside from health insurance, the largest increase in the budget is in the tuition line for special education of $420,000. These dollars are budgeted for replacements for placements under discussion for current students who may need them. We are ethically and legally required to provide these placements if needed. Our special education budget has always been very reasonable and well managed and our special education population is deserving of the services they require. If these placements end up not being needed, this money will be returned to the taxpayers. However, it, is, it would be irresponsible not to include this in the budget, knowing these placements could occur. The difference between the proposed budget and the default budget is only $13,642 more than the money included for, for potential special education placements. I point this out to illustrate the care that we took to bring a very responsible and reasonable budget to the taxpayers. Thank you. I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Jack. Is there any discussion regarding the budget? Any questions? Don't all jump up at once. All right. Then I would entertain a motion to adjourn the deliberative session. Um, is there a second to that? All right. All those in favor of adjourning the deliberative session, please say aye. All right, and I understand, Jack, you want to make a motion as well. I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn our school board meeting. Yeah, only the school board can do that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, sorry. This is... But thank you for your encouragement. Okay, it's, it's moved by Jim Pittman, seconded by Wendy. Uh, all those in favor, signal by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you very right. much for Thank your, you very much, here. ladies and gentlemen.